So we have team number 14 now, and their um, project is titled Centrifugal Compressor Optimization. All right, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are here to talk to you about the optimization of a centrifugal compressor, which is the cold side of a turbocharger, as shown here. My name is Xavier Medina. Here are my teammates, Fernando Lopez and John Frank, John Flamel Pisani. So the outline, we want to review the standards that were used in our project. We want to also go ahead and give you an introduction to the technology of turbochargers, how they're used in today's standards. We want to also go ahead and walk you through the process of optimization, the multiple, multiple design creation that needs to be done, how we will use those designs that are made for mode frontier optimization, also the engineering analysis of the final product, the manufacturing methods, testing, and also our discussion of our findings. So our objectives for this project, we want to design new geometry for the compressor blades, make a different geometry that produces better overall performance and increases pressure output from the stock compressor wheel located in Fernando's Subaru. We want to explore the machine possibilities and verify CFD analyses that were created with compressor bench flow tests. Also, the standards that were used, SAE holds most of the turbocharger standards in today's world. They go ahead and have the standards that need for testing and, and such. ANSI was used for just metrics and in, in measuring dimensions, and also ASTM was for our material selection, and then the threadings and bearings were used just for the assembly of the turbocharger. So I'll be talking to you guys about the technology of turbochargers. Here we have our cold side and we have our hot side, as shown here in our picture. The red is our hot side, this is the turbine. So here we're gonna collect the energy from the engine. This is gonna spin the compressor, and the compressor in turn will force more air into the combustion chamber of the engine. Here we have a 3D model of what we created. Uh, this, this project was very CAD intensive. Here we have a rotating impeller. What this impeller does is that it adds velocity to the air as it comes in. And as the velocity is increased, we have this lower pressure. Now this uh, diverging channel over here that looks like a snail is going to basically change this high high velocity, low pressure region to a low velocity to a high pressure. So the design of the impeller is the most important aspect of a centrifugal compressor, and we need these th dimensions and these tolerances to be very close to each other. We need the gap between the housing and the compressor wheel to be very, very small. The global component for our project is that turbochargers are being used more and more by manufacturers each and every year. They're, they're trying to increase the fuel economy of all of their vehicles, so they're downsizing their engines and adding turbos to them. So instead of having a six-cylinder engine, we'll have a four-cylinder engine with a turbocharger. This is an emerging market, very, a very large emerging market for the United States and for China. It also offers a no-compromise solution because you have more added performance with the same uh, fuel efficient, or same or higher fuel efficiency. Here we can see a graph of China and of North America, which are the two largest uh, emerging markets, and they're expected to double in terms of, of how many turbocharged cars will be produced by the year of 2019. Key global companies that will be uh, spearheading this turbocharged technology are things such as Honeywell, uh, we also have Bohr Warner, and we also have Mitsubishi, as our turbocharger here is created from. Oh, sorry. <laughs> design considerations. Um, our main design consideration is this turbocharger right here. It's a TD04 turbocharger from a Subaru WRX. We decided to use this uh, turbocharger because it was already installed in, in my car right now. <laughs> so <laughs> we figured we'd try and be able to test and use this, this car and this turbo in order to see if we can get any kind of more gains from the, the, the turbocharger. We also needed our our thickness of our airfoils to be large enough to sustain the loads, as well as being lighter and more strong and, and stronger, as well as reducing the cost. So here I'll be talking about the material selections. So material that we were going to be selecting needed to meet three individual criteria. It needed to be strong, it needed to be light, and it needed to be cost effective. The three materials that we that we used were titanium 4540, magnesium WE43 
and the 2000, 6000, and 7000 series of aluminum. Now, titanium 4540 is among the strongest of the three material selections, but it is expensive and heavy. Magnesium, being having the lowest density, allows it to be the lightest, but not as strong as aluminum or titanium, and it is also very expensive. So we had to move into the aluminum. In the 2000 series, it was corrosive. It was very strong and not as machinable as the six or 7,000 series. But the 6,000 series was not as strong as 7,000. 7,000 was comparable to 2,000 in strength. It was light and it was highly machinable, just like the 6,000 series. So it was the best compromise for our material selection. So the approach to the design. Optimization requires that we need not just one, two, or three designs. We need to create many designs. For our design purposes, we went ahead and grabbed eight parameters. With, those eight, with the number of parameters that we choose to modify, we need to multiply by 10, and that's the minimum number of generated designs that we need to create. We went ahead and added 10 more just for purposes of, in case some designs were not feasible, whether machine through manufacturing or through actual CAD modeling. Also, in SOLIDWORKS, there is a function called design tables. Design tables changing the parameters inside of an Excel sheet. SOLIDWORKS can automatically generate all 90 designs within a few instances. So here are the, all the parameters that we will be choosing. Up here is the top sketch thickness, bottom sketch thickness. We will also be using in the actual curve, the spline, we have two points right here and here. We went ahead and modified the Y and Z coordinates of those points. Also, we have our initial angle for the twist, and also the angle between bottom sketch and top sketch. So, here will be the theory of equations. For the theoretical part, we use Bernoulli's equation. Basically, we were relating pressure and velocity. Uh, we also use continuity equation, which relates our mass in and mass flow. We, uh, because we have a divergent channel inside the turbo, we change the area within it. So basically here at the, at the smaller part we have a small area and high velocity and on this part we have a big area and low velocity which increases the pressure using Bernoulli's equation. For the multi-objective optimization we first start to, to create a 3D model of the, of the stock wheel. So basically we use a caliper and measure different uh, distances to be able to create the stock wheel on SOLIDWORKS or, or a 3D design. Then with the CFD analysis of this wheel which is the stock one just as uh, Xavier said, we created 80 designs, changing all, the, all those parameters that we just showed. Then we simulated different parts of the, of the new wheels. So basically, we, we, we got outputs from each type of, for, for each of the 90 parameters. Then we used mode frontier and used those numbers used on the parameters as input and also the average output velocity for, the, for, the, for each wheel. We used that on mode frontier as an input and we wanted to maximize the average output velocity. Then we perform a CFD study of the final design in order to compare those, uh, the numbers obtained from Mode Frontier and SOLIDWORKS. Here we have a flow chart of how we basically did um, all the analysis. We, basically, we started with a CFD, then we optimized it, and then we validated. We compared both results to see how they, 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 if they were off or they were close to each other. Okay, for the mesh, this is this is part of the CFD study. We want we did and make a 3D dynamic rotary mesh because this uh, wheel is going to be rotating. That's how it creates the velocity. And uh, we the best case scenario for us was to create a, a, a computational domain which you see in black uh, to create uh, a one million cells. So it's basically a hundred, a hundred by a hundred X Y Z components. But we we weren't able to do that because of the computational power. We needed a lot more. RAM more processing power in order to be able to create this just a computational domain. So with our computer, we were able to run the simulations at 100,000 cells. Um, it's not as dense as, as dense as a mesh that we wanted, but that's what we were able to, to do. For the um, CFD uh, setup, we used two boundary conditions. Basically, if you see, the, you see in the picture, and also you can see it here. On the inlet of the turbo, we have environmental pressure, and at the outlet, we're also using environmental pressure as considerations. We know that um, those considerations are different on an engine. Why? Because at the outlet, you have a charge piping. So you have a closed volume that you can fill with air and create pressure. At this moment, we, we were just testing the velocity of the air coming out of the compressor wheel. So we were not able to generate pressure by changing velocity. And with Bernoulli's equation, we can relate change in velocity with pressure. 
uh, we use air as a fluid. Okay, for the rotational region, we established that this wheel was going to be rotated at 140,000 RPMs. The limit for this type of uh, systems are 150,000, but that's pretty much that's it. That's uh, the highest you can go. After that, you just basically just break the whole uh, compressor wheel. And it doesn't work. And that's uh, 140,000 uh, RPM is basically 12,500 12, uh, radians per second. We were just rotating the compressor, as you see here, the, the compressor wheel. And our goals, well, we wanted to have a maximum velocity and maximum average velocity at the outlet. Okay, so the, for the mode frontier optimization part, we basically started, there are two components, uh, response surface and evolution algorithms. At this point, I'm going to explain evolution algorithms, which basically creates the population for the design table. So each parameter is it's treated as an individual on a population. So the evolution algorithm uses, uh, resembles nature. So basically, it, com it combines, recombines, and mutates all these parameters in order to create new ones. All these parameters are studied by a function called fitness function. This one evaluates how the new parameter improves or doesn't improve the output. So if it improves the output, it continues to mutate it and combine it. So here we have a, we have a compression between, let's say, we have forces, but in our case, it's <laughs> parameters. <laughs> so what the evolutionary algorithm does, it, it, it's named NSGA, which is non-dominated sorting generic algorithm. <coughs> so each horse, it, let's say we have the first generation, and as it combines different uh, parameters, it creates new generations and new parameters. And with the thickness function, you can say, okay, this one is, get, we're getting a better output, so we continue using this, 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 this change on, on the parameters. For the response surface, it just it basically studies how different independent and dependent variables affect each other in order to uh, reach the goal. We wanted to opt to maximize the average velocity of the outlet. So we use two different methods. We compare them. We use Gaussian process and radial basis. Gaussian process is a more statistical approach and the regular basis is more analytical. Uh, this is also known as a multidimensional interpolation because you have different, uh, a lot of more parameters and you have to get new points uh, this, using the response surface and the evolutionary algorithm. The difference between these two uh, methods were less than 1%. Here we have a, the, the final optimized design with seven plates. If you want to see this, it's, this is a stock wheel which, is, which has seven, six plates and this is the optimized which has Seven plates. Six plates for the stock, sorry, and seven for the optimized. Uh, for the results, we got three ID codes. An ID code refers to eight specific parameters. So for all these three, we got 134.4 for the average velocity at the outlet of the compressor. Um, here we have a multi-dimensional surface which shows two of the parameters that were mostly influential uh, on, on the output. Those two were angle and initial angle. The angle was the angle between the two big plates. So that's one of the, the parameters. And the other one was the initial angle. The initial angle is where, where, you, where you see when you create the loft at the beginning part of the, of the blade, of the big blades. We also have two families, big ones and small ones. This, this angle is just between the big ones. Here we show uh, angle and design ID. Here we can see how response surface and evolution algorithms work together. So the, res uh, the response surface creates the pretty much the function where the evolution algorithm is going to create the different individuals or parameters in our case. If you see at the bottom, you see more points. Why? Because here is where the, where the best possible uh, number for the angle is. So it just creates more there so you can study different uh, options. Here we have the same setup for uh, initial angle, which, is, which was the other parameter considered. Okay, and here. For design selection, we have all the designs that, that, that were generated. We, we went over uh, 25,000 different designs. And we can see here that the goals converge on 134.4 meters per second. Here we compare the output from, from Mold Frontier to SOLIDWORKS. On Mold Frontier, we had 134.4, and on SOLIDWORKS, we had 130.28. They were close by, we, we wanted to have these numbers between 5%. Um, here we show the difference between the optimized wheel and the stock wheel. Uh, these differences are based on velocity at the outlet and RPMs. So we are generating more speed at less RPM, which is better. Um, here we have a video of the whole 
CSV study, we did this for every design. We generated 90 in order to, to be able to create a design table on Mo Frontier. So we did this for every design. So now we went ahead and go, once we had our final product, our optimized design as we had chosen, we wanted to go ahead and do the stress analysis, fatigue and failure analysis, and the deflection analysis on the actual part. So here's a video of the stress analysis. As you can see right here, where it lights up, that is where the most stress will be seen. It's going to be between the connection of the blades and the actual core of the, of the compressor wheel. We can see that it only went up to the green region, which is about two, the maximum mesa of stress was about 289. The actual yield strength to our Alumina 7075 that was chosen is at about 505 megapascals. So here the fatigue and failure. As you can see over here, we wanted to show the different types of aluminums that were able to be chosen and what safety factors we would be given. We went, ahead and, we went ahead and chose T651 due to the fact that it would be better for machinability and manufacturing. As you can see, it is all red. What does this tell us? This tells us that if and when this component would fail, pretty much it wouldn't just, a blade wouldn't just chip off or anything like that and it'll keep working. It will explode in itself. The thing is, <laughs> Unfortunately, it will, but it will all stay within the compressor housing. But as you can see in our life cycles, we went ahead and ran this to 10 to the 7, 000, 7 cycles and assessed the damage after that many number of cycles. The propeller that was passed around, the stock one, it came from this turbo, which was ran for 200,000 miles in the car. You can see that it's still in very good condition and nothing has really happened to it. So the actual sustainability is very is very reliable. Here the deflection analysis, we want to go ahead and show that as you can see, as it's rotating at 140,000 revolutions per minute, wherever there would be a such percentage of deflection would be right at the very tips of the blade, which is why the thickness of the blade have to be considered as a very important parameter. Now, manufacturing. Mr. Alan Narch was kind enough to produce a quote for us and was going to allow us to use his five axis CNC machine to make our final design. The only unexpected problem was that for the CNC machine to create our part, it needed a certain module, which is the Gibbs Cam five axis multi blade level one and level two module. They work together and they have the prices as stated here. Then he gave us a, a ballpark figure of 1800 for machining cost which in total was $18,450 as our quote. Being a self-sustained budget, that was a constraint. We had to explore <laughs> other options, and that is where Professor Ziccarelli was able to help us in exploring other options. We found Incodema 3D that were able to go ahead and 3D print the aluminum uh, design. The only thing is that the quote was still very high for us considering our self-sustained budget. So we went ahead and did an acrylic-like 3D printing from WB Engineering, which is owned by FIU alumni. They went ahead and printed our piece out for $150. <laughs> Moving along with the cost analysis that we have for manufacturing, we also have, also have cost analysis for our research and our CAD modeling. CAD modeling was a very intensive part of this project, as we can see. Sorry, we have a total cost, estimated cost of $176. If you had licensing for better CAD modeling uh, software, we, this price would also increase. Software simulation was also another cost factor in this uh, prototype creation, as well as optimization and manufacturing. We had an, uh, a hopeful price of $1,000 for manufacturing, but the only thing that came close to us for that was that 3D printed aluminum. But that in itself is not a very high quality finish and it leaves it very grainy. So it wasn't ideal for what we needed it to be done with. We needed, we needed it for. The optimization was very generously given to us, provided to us by the Madrock Laboratory, as well as the software simulation. Uh, we, we were not able to use a higher, a higher powered uh, software. So we, we estimated these prices here. Uh, obviously, if we have a higher, uh, a more expensive licensing, we, you know, this price would increase as well. We had a total cost of $266. Uh, for testing, we could not test our final, final uh, prototype, but this is our cost estimates for our initial testing and our actual testing as $440. The, the main surprise here was the man hours. Uh, this was a very 
time intensive uh, process. And it cost for, it was 441 man hours, and it estimating at thirty dollars an hour per person. We were at thirteen thousand two hundred thirty dollars. So it's a very expensive project. <laughs> expensive. <laughs> for testing, although we could not actually physically test this product, we do have two. We did have two. Uh, possibly three that we wanted to three testing things that we wanted to do. We wanted to make a machine, a flow bench that could test the, our uh, software simu uh, software simulation by having both uh, environmental pressures in and out and testing to see what velocities we could get, as well as a miles per gallon test to see uh, the practicality of our of our compressor. Here we have here we have a flow bench system on our left, and we have a data collecting computer to our right. The data collected computer would show the amount of air and pressure that would be coming out. So if we go to our next slide real quick, we have two 250-gallon uh, tanks of compressed air, which would be blowing out through right, oops, sorry, through right here, through the uh, turbine housing. So this turbine housing would rotate this compressor wheel as, as in a real car, and we'd be able to have the rotational speed that we need of 140,000 RPMs, which could not be done by any kind of machine or any kind of gear system. It would be nearly impossible, or probably more expensive to make that than to actually uh, to test it. So another uh, option that we also wanted to do, if we could have our metal, uh, our metal product, would be to have a miles per gallon test. We would do a 45 miles in this route through a Florida highway system and we have at a constant speed, at a constant time of day, as well as a constant <laughs> pump, in order to verify, in order to verify whether we have any, any kind of, any kind of uh, gain in miles per gallon from our regular stock engine to our new, new design. <laughs> okay, so here as you can see the GAN chart, we went ahead and showed how the research and CAD modeling and simulation is the biggest part to the very big chunk the limitation of computing power is what made everything kind of, every simulation was taken in about approximately 40 minutes to an hour. And we had 90 designs. And we still had a few more designs that we had to validate after that. So here we have the, um, the white areas and our distribution of our responsibilities. White areas would be just minor roles and then the pink areas would be the supporting roles. We were all very working together in every single part. We didn't leave each other alone. We wanted to make sure that we had, we were well distributed around all the knowledge of this, of our project. Now, the next stage, as you can see, the biggest problem right there, funding, sponsorship. We wanted to, something that we definitely would need to do for further learning and further um, research would be to get companies to back us up or get sponsorship to where we can actually expand all of our all of our processes <laughs> and also we wanted to utilize more advanced CFD analyses so uh, also manufacturing we do have a company know a company that goes ahead and creates custom wheels that to for, to definitely accommodate it to your compressor housings so that would be Wicked Wheels that could definitely make our, our product, our final product. And we would like to have to perform our bench test and our mile per gallon test. So in conclusion, we went ahead and went through the whole process of optimization, created many different designs, went and simulated all, all, simu all designs, and ex extensively went into finally going into manufacturing and everything, exploring all possibilities. As stated by Fernando, we did have, there's a big booming business for turbocharged technology. There is a big increase, and this shows that this is something that engineers all around the world can definitely push towards to and keep learning about because it's an ever-changing technology. We would like to acknowledge our advisor, Dr. George Zuli Kravich, uh, the graduate students Sohail Reddy and Rajesh who helped us in all findings, professor and machinist Richard Ziccarelli who definitely helped us out exploring possibilities, Alan Marsh, the president of Southern Gear, for the quotes that were given to us, and the Made Rock Laboratory. Thank you very much for your time and your attendance. Right now, we will take any questions. Okay, um, I think you guys did a lot of work, right? But there's a real, real serious problem, okay? You can't do all the work and then at the end say, cost considerations led us to not do any validation of that work, right? That's a real problem. Because at the beginning, you should have known, I'm telling you, you should have looked and said, 
hey, can we make our final design? Anyone can tell you, if you were to come talk to me, I could tell you 7,000 series aluminum you're not going to make. I'll tell you that right from the beginning, okay? I'll tell you that right from the beginning. So what you need to do is design your optimization for a real problem that you can solve, okay? Because if you're waiting till the end to try to do validation on that, of course it's going to not come through, right? There's a mil I'm, I'm upset because you guys did a great job. And it frustrates me because this is useless, right? I mean, there's really no use for it because we don't know if it'll work or not, right? It, it, it definitely upset us as well. And right, it's, right. It is um, kind of a, we did drop the ball in that area. Right. In that part, and... Uh, I mean, you have all this setup, right? You have a whole setup where you can do all sorts of flow experiments, right? Why wouldn't you come up with a flow experiment that you could actually run and then do optimization on that setup? Well, that doesn't, you can 3D print parts, you can do all, we have so many other opportunities to make things that actually work and we can do real science, right? Why wouldn't we do that? It was um, something that I, I guess I could say that is project management, mm -hmm. as you have stated before in previous presentations, and to all of us, we definitely, something that needs to be, was overlooked and needs to be taken into consideration for future research pro, uh, projects. <coughs> Right. This is something that um, we were not aware. We did uh, talk to Alan Arch previous to our final design, and then we kind of got sidetracked with that last little thing. So when did, let me ask you just a quick question. When did you get the quote for $15,000 for 7,000 series? First week of November. First week of November. So you yes. waited all that way to say, hey, maybe we need to make our product at the end? That's when we get the ultimate design. Yeah, well, right, so <laughs> you didn't think a little bit beforehand, hey, can we make this thing before you started doing 90,000 simulations, right? I mean, he, we, we did talk to him, and he did tell us that we were, you know, being that he had the five-axis machine, it was mm -hmm. going to be able to be done. The only thing was that, you know, they, on that, when, when, when I previously met up with him, when I first met up with him, he said, oh, no, yeah, we, we're going to be able to get it done. And then the next day they called me and told me that, oh, When was that? When was that? This was, I believe, it was in, like I said, first week of November, so I want to say November 2nd, November 3rd. So when did you start this project? We started this project in January. Well, all of the actual stuff were actually started about February. So you came up with the idea around February, something like mm -hmm. that, right? That's, that's the concern. That's, that, and that's a major concern for everybody, right? Yeah. Everybody. We can't just say, hey, we can't do this because of cost. I'd love to go to the moon. That'd be great, right? But we can't. I can't do that because of cost. So I need to make a project that's that's reasonable and feasible. Okay, that's my major. Thank you. So I want to say congratulations because yeah. you guys did a a CFP multivariate analysis beyond anticipation for all the ground problems. That's fine. Something that I want to what is fake first. Second, I was checking your your prototype. And I have a question because even though the diameter is a small one, and you guys said that you went through your analysis, you even though you want obviously in two machines like this, we always want to increase RPM as much as we can to increase several things like efficiency or or volumetric flow rate that you guys did. That for that 140 RPM, 1000 RPM that you guys set up, did you check my number? On the, went on the outlet, on the CFD analysis, what went over the value of Mach number? I have that curiosity. On different parts, because the area was so small. If you, I mean, if you see the interior part of the, of the compressor housing, there are very small areas. And then you get peaks. Oh, exactly. You get those peaks, and those are maximum values that we didn't take into account. Why? Because this could be just peaks at different points. We didn't want to take that into the whole analysis, because there could be mistakes on the, on the CFD, because we didn't have the yeah. best mesh possible. So that's why we didn't take it back up. But it did, it did went over Mach 1 on certain points, but it could be okay, used. That, that's the error, because sometimes when you go up over Mach 1, then there, your CFD analysis can change, right? Yeah. But, then, but even though the, the diameter is a small one. Yeah. Thank you. I want to comment on, when I saw Jamal's centrifugal compressor optimization, I was like, good night. <laughs> <laughs> but you did something that not many of the teams that I saw today did. You explained in the very beginning what it was and why it was important. And that's really important to people who are not mechanical engineers. And I know this is a technical presentation, but I want to compliment you on that. 
So you were able to follow. Oh, yeah, yeah. and I remember my turbocharger failing in my old Volkswagen. I can relate. Yeah, really the problem, and it ties in fact what Dr. Basil said, you said right in your report that based on experimental and numerical simulation analysis, the team will develop the blade design for centrifugal compressor using computational optimization methods. The ultimate goal was to create a blade design which would result in a wider optimum operating range. Okay. The question I ask is, and, and I do understand that engineering, a lot of times things don't go the way expected. That's, that's just, that's the name of the game. Just wait, you'll see. Um, if you can't make the prototype in aluminum, but you could make the prototype with another concept, why didn't you take that new design, compare it to the old design in that simulation mode, and demonstrate that it could meet a wider optimum operating range? Uh, I believe that probably the, the graph that we sh talked about in the presentation would be <coughs> the most optimal to explain that. Uh, Experimentally. I would have done the, the issue experimentally is that we made it out of acrylic glass, and that does not, it cannot sustain the same rotational speed as a metal would. So we, we it was a very. I don't think you would have risky. had to go to those ranges to be able to prove that you could be, you can meet your goal. That's because that's where it's going. You need to simulate it. Yeah, of course. And simulation doesn't necessarily have to be at full. full well, here we have both wheels, right? If you see at the bottom, we compare different RPMs. If you go from, let's say, the lowest. Is that one, experimental? Yeah, the CFD, the CFD study. It's a setup. It's basically the same setup. CFD. CFD. It's yeah. not so it's a it's a it's 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 We have So the, the, the reason. So I mean, it, I, I understand, understand your problem. The, the I don't want to spend the money, but you got another way of doing this. The reason why we didn't do it experimentally is because, as stated, the acrylic would not be able to withstand that. And since Trying to go ahead and compare acrylic to the aluminum, the actual stock wheel, our numbers were going to be really way off. So we, we felt that it would not be. Now, if we had the same stock wheel in the acrylic, yeah, That's both what in the I same materials, on. then same we material. would have loved to have tested it. But uh, due to the time crunch after that, after the uh, finding out that we couldn't machine it, our machining possibilities pretty much came down to the last week. So okay. that is my, where my last question to you, the fatigue simulation that you executed. Yes. Did you make an assumption that the, the system was a continuum? Continuum, what substance? Uniform isotropic properties. Yes, we assumed that it was adiabatic, that the air would not, was it, uh, compressible, but it does not change in temperature. So we did not take that into account in our uh, analysis. Is that realistic to you? But uh, going back to uh, fatigue analysis at the previous slide where you showed four pieces criteria, 259 megapascal or something, there was, yes, 289. Did you consider temperature into this? Because when you mentioned that uh, something of the order of 500 megapascal is the yield strength for 7,000 a lot, this is a considering at what temperature? You know, as you increase temperature, there's the exponential decay in the strength of the fatigue. Well, in uh, being that this is the, we, we understand that through compression, there will be a temperature spike. But being that this is the actual cold part, it won't really be subject to extreme temperatures. We're looking at about, this is just kind of uh, uh, thinking, maybe close to going up at least maybe to about, let's say, 100 degrees Celsius. It will not be experiencing too much. To the point that it'll it'll actually decay it or affect its. So something rotating at 140,000 RPM, right, mm -hmm. and at 100 degrees centigrade, 10 to the power of 7 cycle, <laughs> and that will behave same as room temperature. Are you sure? <laughs> we will not. We will not. We we made our assumptions a lot basically on our computing power, uh, so we could not uh, completely fully simulate our our system as is in in the conditions that are in a car. So there, there are a lot more things that we, 
more assumptions that we that we made in order to have a, something feasible, uh, and we tried our best to 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 reach a, our final optimized design based on just uh, Bernoulli's principle. As many of what we used, we did not take into consideration the com uh, the density really changes in air and to the temperature. Uh, we didn't take into consideration when when the let's say when when the, the engine lets off, right? You have this change in, in radiation in, in um, rotational speed, so you'd also have this different this shock that we didn't take those things into account. If I can ask one last question, and that is regarding your optimization. So you use this uh, software, uh, basically, which is Professor Dorita, which uses and we provide. So for you, it's a black box. What do you know about this software? What are its limitations? Can you tell? Well, basically, I did the optimization part, and we use all the parameters that we create randomly generated. And then we just input that on the program. We use different methods. Basically, all the guys from the fluid uh, department told us what to do, because there are a lot of different options, and there are a lot of different things that we could do, but they're not simple. So we were able to use those processes in order to create a population or the different, sorry, the different, the different parameters using evolution algorithms. We, and then with the response circle, we create the field for, the, for this thing to work. We're not really in deep with, with all the optimization part. We, we went over the, a lot of things. We went to CFD, then optimization, so a lot of things to consider. You said 80 designs. Why not 800? What if I said okay. 2,800? What will happen? If, if you get more designs, you get more reliable data. But, okay, so that's my question is, when you whenever you optimize, uh, you need, uh, and you said, you know, internal, internal aid extrapolation. This is, so how do you come to that? Now, why not 40 designs? Why not? Why not 40? Yeah. There are not enough parameters. We need more. So how do you decide? This is exactly my point. How do you come to 80? Why not 40? Why not 800? How do you? Usually, the more designs, the better. Right? But I mean, each design has to be CFD study. That takes time. So if you have 400 designs and there no one, up, there were not too many. We did it each so, one. So I repeat my question: Why 80? Why not 82? No, we should no. have done a dimension analysis first. Okay, you didn't answer the question. Fine. Okay. And then you have that answer. You guys have that answer. You have that answer. You do have that answer. You talked about it. You have that answer. I think you mentioned that. Like, like I said, this was. This was also going into talking with right Sohail no. and, and uh, Professor Julie Kravitz. They told us this is just a minimum number, 